Welcome to worship at First Reformed Church. Why don't we stand this morning and greet each other in the name of the Lord. Smile, touch an elbow, whatever you're comfortable with. this morning. Nothing too major. Uh, this week will be the second Thursday Treasures Gathering at 10 a.m. here at the church with some food and fellowship. And you are to invite neighbors, friends, family, whoever to join. I heard they had a great uh, Thursday Treasures last time. So if you have any questions, I'm guessing you could probably see Rhonda. Uh, but what's that? Or Bonnie. And Thursday morning... 10 a.m. Other announcements. VBS this summer, July 10 through 15. You'll be seeing a link to the sign-up page if you want to volunteer. Dave's already nodding his head at me. Yep, I'm in. Volunteer, uh, Mer or the Methodist Church is leading it this year, this summer. So uh, our role is to do a drama and bring some food one night and then uh, just fill in as leaders wherever the sign-up sheet has gaps. Any other announcements this morning before we get started? Any other business to take care of? I don't have that much today. I see a lot of yawning. A lot of yawning. I should count on Sunday morning. I think I'm up to four. No other business. How many people have been to at least one graduation party so far, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Are you going to other towns and just stopping by? I don't understand. It's that time of year. Uh, well, if there's no other business or announcements, I would invite you to stand this morning as we open and worship together. The praise team will come forward. Oh, before we do, uh, if you were here, if you were not here, it doesn't matter. Give a round of applause to our cooks this morning who uh, made some pretty amazing... Get the sandwiches despite the fact that there were some griddle problems, I heard, but we still, mine was extra crispy and perfect, so thank you very much. Let's stand and greet each other one more time. Say good morning to those around you. And let's worship the Lord.
One thing I forgot to mention in the announcements is that uh, the roofing crew came in this week, Wednesday through Friday, and redid the whole roof on the east side, um, which you can't really see unless you're maybe half a block away, but if you want to take a look at it after church, drive around, they did a really nice job, and uh, hopefully we'll never see another leak in the furnace room, but we're happy that it's done. And there's a couple little patches of pavement out front you may have seen that we think they're crane damaged, and they're going to be working on that to get it fixed. So if there's an orange cone there, know that you shouldn't park there. Um, prayer updates. Oh, uh, I got called midweek. Um, one of the other pastors in town uh, got sick, and at the last second, uh, they needed somebody to fill in for a wedding yesterday. Um, and I said, I would love to fill in for a wedding yesterday because I just love weddings. Andrew will tell you I just love weddings, don't I? It was so much fun. It was actually really fun. Uh, Sue Ponder's daughter, Meredith, I know a lot of you know the Ponder family. Um, I'm on the library board here in town. Uh, in Des Moines, the rain held off. The weather was perfect. It was awesome. We had a really good time. Um, and God is good. Uh, other prayer updates, I see Kurt and Alicia are back from their trip to Mayo, and we have a week or two here at least to see if this latest treatment is working, so we are going to be praying hard that this latest treatment is going to just knock it out of the park, and we'll all be shocked and then go, oh, that's right, God is good, and uh, it is fixed, but uh, we will be praying hard for them in the coming week, two weeks. Praying for our grads, our students, our teachers as the end of the year is closer and closer. Um, I don't know if I have other updates from people in the bulletin. Does anybody have any updates or anything new from the prayer concerns, joys or concerns that they would mention this morning? No business, no joys or concerns. This is a quiet crowd today. Everybody must just be tired. Everybody take your right hand and go like this. Hold it up in the air. Left hand stays down, right hand up. Left hand down, right hand up. Make sure you got the right hand. Now take your hand and go like this. Just poke your neighbor once real quick. <laughs> Say, wake up. Give him a little pinch if you need to. See, the people sitting on the end, like Donna back there is like, I got nobody. Janet's like, nobody's poking me and I'm poking nobody. That's a good Sunday. Well, if there's no other uh, joys or concerns, then I would invite you to grab the hand of somebody you're sitting with. If you're sitting alone, grab your other hand, um, the hands we hold uh, this week. I know there's several families traveling out of town for family graduations, family parties, vacations, work, all kinds of things. People watching online, the hands we hold uh, represent those hands as well, as we know that the Holy Spirit holds us together as if we were in the same room, regardless of where we are in the world. Uh, God connects us. So let's come to God in prayer this morning. Lord, we are uh, so thankful for the good weather that we received this week. We are thankful for uh, the opportunities for the farmers to get out in their field and either finish planting or make some good headway. Lord, we are uh, thankful that even when the news of this world is its craziest, there are still mornings we can go outside and just feel the goodness of your world shine on our faces from the sun or breeze across our skin or wave at us from the leaves and the trees. Lord, we remember this morning that despite the craziness of the world, your focus is still on every single one of us, that you do not neglect or leave behind any one of your lambs. You are constantly meeting us on the road of life every day and reminding us how important we are to you. God, hear our prayers this morning of thanksgiving for a, a wonderful work crew who was able to fix our roof. Hear our prayers of praise this morning for a beautiful couple that got married in Des Moines yesterday and our chance as a church to help out another church in a time of need. Lord, we know that uh, you are at work in all the churches in this community this morning, all over this state and all over this world, that we are one family under you. Lord, hear our prayers this morning for Kurt 
and his latest treatment, God, we're just going to keep coming to you in humble prayer, Lord, looking for this problem to be fixed. God, let this latest treatment take hold and do exactly what it needs to do to Kurt's body. Lord, let him feel your spirit move in ways that cannot be explained. Lord, we want to hear doctors say they are shocked and nurses rejoice. Most of all, we pray for the whole Bryles family to continue to feel your heavenly patience and grace as they wait day by day. But God, we are thankful they made it home again safe this week. Thankful for the doctors and nurses who took care of them. God, continue to hear our prayers for Austin overseas. Lord, let him feel your spirit this week. In whatever way, shape, or form possible, God, remind him he is connected to not only the church here in Prairie City, but the family and friends of this community. That he feels our love through your spirit. God, we continue to pray for those that we love who are recovering from surgeries, recovering from uh, hospital stays that are just praying for strength and patience in the meantime. God, hear our prayers for Esther and Arnie and Daryl, Dorothy and Tom. Lord, you hear our prayers every week for those that we love dearly who are on a journey battling cancer. Lord, we know the names that could be spoken aloud in this room by this congregation would take a very long time to get through, Lord, but we know that you have burned them onto our hearts. Those that we have been putting in the bulletin, those that have just remained in our own prayers at night. God, hear our prayers for all of those on that journey at this moment whether they are celebrating, whether they are suffering, whether they are finishing treatment, whether they are beginning treatment. Lord, we know that regardless of the outcome, your presence is with them on this walk. God, as we celebrate so many Saturdays and Sundays this month with those graduating, we would pray, Lord, that you would be already putting the pieces together in their hearts, giving them the calm to look towards an uncertain future, to understand that regardless whether they have it all planned out or whether they are completely confused about what comes next, you will be there to guide them. Lord, we would pray that they would be able to rely on your word to lead them, on your spirit to hold them close when they are worried or stressed or nervous. Those that are looking towards more school, those who are looking to the job fields, Lord, those who right now are saying, I don't know what comes the day after school ends. God, we know that uh, we read over and over in your book that if we hold your word tightly, we will succeed. Lord, you know all of our hearts and know that we have all let the word slip at times, even in the last week. We've said and done things against your will. But God, we would pray this morning that once again we could claim the promise you made to us to take all of the sin we carry, the ugliness, the baggage, the things that have been heaped upon our shoulders, and you would remove them. Lord, if there is anything we should confess to you right now, we know that you can remove it from us. You can take the sin and wipe it away. You can remind us that we are always welcome home to follow your word again. We offer those things to you now in a silent prayer.
God, hear our voice in unison, acknowledging that we are your people as we close this prayer with the words that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Children are invited forward this morning for the children's message. Come on down. Come on down. Oh, if you've got quarters or change and you want to wave your hand as the kids go past, there's some, there's a hand over there. We'll see how many kids come down. And if we got any brave ones, we only have two. Only two this morning. See if we have any brave ones. Any hands waving? There's some hands. You guys want to go out to all the people? Oh my goodness, there's a lot of hands this week. A lot of hands and a slightly smaller group. So they're going to have a lot of work to do today. Oh yeah, he's going. He's right. Oh boy. Oh, we got bills this week. Oh, must have been a good week. Oh boy, there's some more. Any more hands? More hands. There's some right down the middle. There's some way in the back in the middle. Oh, there's one right over there, Doug in the red shirt. Oh, there's one way in the back. I see Mary waving her hand. Oh, there's more. She was ready for her grandkids today. Any other hands before they sit down? Five, four, three, two. All right, grab a seat. All right, now I have something to tell you that I should have thought of before now. I didn't find out where you guys hid the crosses last week, and only one of you is here that hid the crosses. Maisie's not here. I have no idea where Maisie put her cross, but you hid one too, right, Chase? Do you remember where you hid it? That didn't look real confident. Are you sure? (laughs) All right, well, you three, since Jace knows where he hid the cross, I, I don't know either. Can I look? Oh, man. You three, and I'll go out with you, but I won't look. We got to find where Jace hid the little wooden cross, and we might find Maisie's, I hope, maybe, because there's two. But you need to tell us if we're getting warmer or colder, okay? You do remember, right? <laughs> oh, boy, this could be, this, there could be no sermon today. We could just be looking for crosses. All right, are we ready? Set, Go. Is anybody warm? Aiden is the closest, probably. Did you look to see if it was here this morning? Did you look to see if it was here this morning? No. So we're going to hope Renee's cleaning didn't go, hey, look at that, a cross. We found a cross. Did you find it? Are we getting warmer? No. How about now? Am I getting warmer now? Yes. Oh, it's maybe back here somewhere. Maybe back here. Did anybody, if anybody finds a wooden cross in your pew, we're really warm. You guys are really warm, I heard. Look in that pew. Look there. Look. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, right here. Look. Right here. We found it. Now, do we keep looking for Maisie's, or do we just wait and hope she remembers next week? Should we just stick? we'll wait, unless anybody else is going to wave their hand and say, hey, there's one near us. I have no clue. Well, you found it. That means you get to hide it after church today. You get to pick a place to hide it, and that was a very tricky spot, and I would commend everybody out there who didn't just grab it, because I would be very tempted if I found it hidden during the week to just grab it. But today, oh, that worked so perfect, because you know what? We had some people help us find it, didn't we? And today's Bible story is about this lady named Rahab, who helps some people because God tells her to. And you know what? I was driving home from Des Moines yesterday, and I stopped to get gasoline, and I saw something really neat 
at the gas station. I was sitting there. I put my pump in to put the gas in. I went and sat in my car until it was full. And in front of me, it looked like a dad and a teenage son. And I, I'm thinking it was dad and son, but I didn't talk to him. And the dad was pumping gas, and his son got out. And you know the things you wipe your windows with? You dip them in the water, and then you run it on the window, and it cleans your windshield? Are you guys tired too? Have you never gotten, have your parents ever let you do that? No. Have you ever wiped your windshield? People. <laughs> that was the most fun thing to do when I was a kid. You stop at a gas station, you say, can I wipe the window? But the son cleaned his own windshield off, and then there was another couple right next to him, and they both went in to the gas station to get something or go to the bathroom or something and I saw the dad say something to the boy and the boy smiled and he walked over and he cleaned off their windshield and then they both got in the car and they waited for the couple to come back out and I don't think the couple even noticed. (laughs) They just got in the car and left and you could see the dad and the boy both kind of look at each other and laugh but you know what I thought was so neat. They did not know that somebody had done something nice, but I would not be surprised if halfway home they didn't say, where's that big squished bug that was right there? That this boy did something nice even though nobody knew about it. So your challenge this week as you color your picture of Rahab is to think to yourself, how can I be kind or helpful to someone? What do you think she's doing there? You think she's fallen asleep? She's actually, these two guys were being chased by some very bad people, and Rahab said, I will hide you because God wants me to help you. So she hid them under some plants so that they could hide. You guys color that for me today? Okay. And you're going to hide the cross, and we need to pray, and then we'll hand out sheets and colors, and suckers are right over there on the bench, okay? Can we fold our hands and pray? All right, let's pray. Dear God, we are thinking today about Rahab and how she did something wonderfully kind and helped two strangers. And we think about the boy at the gas station. And we think about all the times during the week that we can help people and they may not even know we can just be kind. And we do it all because you tell us to in our hearts. So God, if there's a chance this week to pick up a piece of trash, to put a dish away, to pick a pillow up off the floor, to wash a windshield, to help someone who needs help carrying something. God, we would pray that you would remind us these are the things you call us to do every day. We pray this in your name and all of God's children said, amen. Amen. I'm going to invite the congregation to stand up to sing our next hymn together, Be Thou My Vision as we hand out sheets and crayons. Let's stand and sing together. You guys grab one each and you go get a sucker. You want to hand them out?
First scripture today comes from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29. I would ask you to read along with me as I read it aloud. Let us hear from the book of the Lord. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. We are continuing on through the book of Joshua uh, this week, I love this week's story from Joshua. It's probably one of the more well-known stories from the book of Joshua. I love this story because it is one of those stories that I don't know if I've fully come to grasp with its purpose, but this week I think I got a little closer maybe to uh, its intended purpose in Scripture. I'm a big fan of stories in general, especially stories where the ending hits you and you did not see coming what was coming, that the most important part was something that just kind of shocks you in the end. One of my favorite stories, I looked through my notes. I don't think I've ever told it here for this congregation, um, but I know I've shared it before. It was a very popular story, probably about 10 years ago for some reason, even though the story actually took place in the 70s. So pardon me if you've heard this one, uh, but when the story kind of leaked out, it spread like wildfire for a while. There's this company in Chicago, a factory called Vienna Beef, and they make all kinds of beef products. Uh, most notably, they make hot dogs, and their hot dogs are the ones that are a little redder than the other hot dogs, and they have a little snap to the skin. And as the story goes, this company started in the late 1800s, and they grew and grew and grew on this block where they started to the point where their buildings filled pretty much the entire city block. And uh, it was there until the 1970s when they said, you know, we've grown from just a simple street cart now to this massive operation that ships uh, hot dogs and meat all over the world. We need to get with the times. We need to, um, we need to get more efficient. We need to reinvest in this company and uh, do this in a better, bigger way. So I think it was 1972, they found a new place to build and they built a brand new factory on the other side of the river in Chicago to make their Vienna beef hot dogs. And it went perfect. They had all new machines, they had a much smaller, more efficient building, everything was exactly as it was supposed to be except they noticed immediately the hot dogs no longer tasted good. They were fine, but they weren't that special Vienna beef hickory smoke flavor that they'd been serving for almost a hundred years. So they spent months trying to figure out where they messed up. And they went over the recipe over and over again. They went over the companies. They got the ingredients from over and over again. They thought maybe it was the water on the other side of Chicago. So they brought water from the one side to the other side. Still wasn't good. They thought maybe it was the brand new machines they were using. So they tested and retested those. This went on for months. And then they said they finally figured out the problem not through a highly paid research company coming in or the board of directors think tanking it in a back room. They figured it out because a bunch of workers on the line went out one night to have drinks together and started reminiscing about the old factory. And one of them finally mentioned the secret as to what was going on that they'd been missing for months when he remembered the name Irving. And Irving was the guy that when the meat was first processed into hot dog shape, loaded it on the cart, and then had to take it all the way across the factory to the room where it was smoked 
and cooked. And since this was such a big old factory all the way across the other side of the city block, he had to wind through this maze of all these different rooms, and every different room had its own temperature, had its own machinery, had its own people. And he said the walk to get from where the meat started to where the meat was cooked was a 30-minute walk. In the new factory, it was a 30-second walk. The difference was that that walk let the meat warm just enough that the flavor sank in to the hot dogs and they had to spend more months and tens of thousands of dollars to build an Irving room where they would put the meat to try to recreate the exact conditions that Irving had given to the hot dogs. Because Irving had been downsized and had retired because his job was no longer necessary in the new factory. I think that story is so perfect for the end of today's story because it is a reminder that no matter how big or smart or important we think we might be, you cannot lose sight of the importance of every individual in the story. There is no one person on earth that you could remove that wouldn't leave some sort of serious ripples behind. Last week, we saw God call Joshua after Moses' death to be the new leader of the Israelite people, to lead them to the promised land. Today, we are starting in chapter 2 of Joshua starting with verse 1. And we see something happen here in chapter 2 that is very similar to something that happened in Joshua's own life. Joshua had been at Moses' side for the whole time that they'd been traveling through the desert. He is now in charge of God's people. And Joshua 2 tells us this. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim, Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they, the spies, went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. If you are familiar with the story of Joshua, you may remember that earlier, when Moses was still alive, earlier, when they were looking to take over some land that God had said, I promise this land will be yours, Joshua was one of a number of spies that was sent to check out the land to make sure God was on the level. And all the spies, except for Joshua and this guy named Caleb, came back and said, forget it, these guys are too big, these armies are too great, we can't do it. But it was Joshua and Caleb who said, no, God told us we could do this, we can do this. And now we have Joshua immediately after taking over from Moses, doing the same thing Moses did. God said, this land is yours. You can go and take it. But he puts the brakes on and says, wait, I'm going to send a couple people to check this out before we get there. And they have found Rahab, a prostitute in Jericho. And we don't know why they went to Rahab's, but many people suspect they were trying to keep a low profile and they were just in a bad part of town where people might not notice strangers. But lo and behold, verse 2, the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And then we see Rahab make a choice here that we get no explanation for yet. We just know that when she finds out her entire city is about to be raided by these people from another country, instead of saying, my civic pride forbids me to do anything other than save Jericho, she immediately turns on her own community and hides the spies. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. 
At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. She lies. We don't know why. All we can guess at this point is these spies in some way, shape, or form relayed to her what God was doing and she had to make the decision Do I make a choice to do something literally every other person I know on earth is going to be mad at me for? Or do I listen to these guys who say they're working for God? Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. I've seen the writing on the wall. I know that God has a bigger purpose for this town, and you're a part of it. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God in heaven above and on the earth below. She had been hearing the stories of what had been happening God's people, and she uses a phrase that I think echoes truth to anybody who's a follower of God. They heard stories about God's power and their hearts melted. How many times have we heard somebody give a portion of their testimony or some way they've seen God at work around them or in their lives? They have heard a story of what God has done for someone else And it makes it feel like your heart is melting in your chest. You are overcome with what can only be the Holy Spirit getting your attention and saying, look at what God is doing. This woman had a moment where God caught her attention and said, look at what you are in the midst of. You can get on board or you can do what you would rather do and just hang out with the city. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Her first instinct, it turns out, is not even to save her own life, but for the lives of her family. And then she says, our lives for your lives. The men assured her, if you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return, and then go on your way. Possibly a little echo to Jesus going to the tomb for three days, in the same way these spies will hide for three days until the world thinks the danger's past and moves on. The men said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless, when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you have let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into the house, if anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, 
we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Tie a red cord out the window so that when the army comes to town, they will know that is the house that faithfully let our spies go. That is the house where the woman of faith lives. We will leave them alone. This is one of those linchpin stories in between the Old Testament and the New Testament where we see both echoed at the same time. The red cord, very similar to the blood of the lamb that the Old Testament people put over their door frames that when the Spirit of God flew through, he knew who protected that house and he let them be. The Passover. Echoing the blood of of Jesus in the New Testament that was spilled to show who protected those people who followed Christ. In the same way, this woman was going to give a sign to the world that only a select few would understand. My life is not my own. The life of my family is not their own. We belong to God, and this is our signal. Agreed, she replied, let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down to the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a good story. One of the stories, one of the few in Scripture where a prostitute is the main character. I think it only happens a couple other times in the Bible when God uses someone in that position to serve him faithfully and lives are changed. But one of the things I thought about as I read this story numerous times was what is really the point? especially because this is a book about Joshua and the Israelites. God said, this land will be yours. This city will be yours. And yet Joshua immediately goes back and does something that he saw almost fail under the previous administration. God promised, but we're going to double check. Let's send some spies to see if we can do this. And he had to know full well that even if they could take it, those spies could come back just like the ones he went with and say, we're too scared to go forward. Why bother sending the spies when he knew God had already promised? What's the point? Why doesn't it just go from chapter 1 to chapter 3? And then I stumble across a commentary this week, the only one I found that really mentioned this, that asked the exact same question I had, which is, what is the real point? And it said this, in the midst of this crazy world, in the midst of this about to be war in the midst of these two giant armies that were going to clash, in the midst of this story of Jericho that we will go through that is one of the most famous stories of the Bible that has echoed through generations of the walls falling and God's people being successful in the midst of this world-shattering story that's about to take place. This is another instance of God pausing, turning up the focus really tightly, finding the one person in the story that we should not care about and reminding us everybody matters. Do not lose focus on the smallest person in this story. Yes, armies are about to clash. Yes, the world is about to change. But God stops for a second, 
focuses in on Rahab and reminds us this is the whole point as to why he is at work at all. God is not a nation builder. He is a person builder. The people that we look at and dismiss and throw away, God stops and reminds us occasionally in Scripture, these are exactly the people he is here to love and represent and save. And as we go on to the New Testament and to Matthew, it is even said more explicitly, there are tax collectors and prostitutes who are getting into heaven before all of you temple goers even understand what's going on. It has nothing to do with what you've done. It has to do with the faith you have going forward. It has to do with that moment when you stop and say to yourself, I know the right thing to do because God laid it on my heart. Do I do it? Or do I take the easy path? God stops in this beginning story of Joshua and reminds us, regardless of how big the world spins around us, every single person on this earth will have those moments when they hear God's call in their heart and have to make the simple decision. Do I want to be covered by the blood of the Lamb? Do I want to hang the cord from my window? Do I want to follow Christ to the cross, do I want to do what God's asking me to do or just step back and avoid it all because that's so much easier. I like that reading of this story. I like the fact that God took a moment in Scripture to focus all the way in on one sinful woman and remind us, this is what my whole story is all about. Don't forget, I am a God of people, not of land and money and power and fame and armies. I am a God of each individual. They all belong. They all matter. They are all called. Let's pray together. God, we hear the story that we have heard since we were little this morning of Rahab. And Lord, looking back with what we know now, it is so easy to see how she made the right choice. It is so obvious to us what the choice should have been. It is so obvious to us that we should just fall in line behind you when you are moving and do exactly what you say because it is always for our benefit. And yet, God, we fail at it in our own lives every day. We hear your call about what is truly important around us and we dismiss it because it is easier to just disappear into the background of our communities. We hear your call to follow your word, to look out for those around us, to serve you in whatever way possible to reveal your kingdom. And yet, God, it always comes down to that choice. Who will we follow in the moment? Lord, give us the courage of Rahab this week. Remind us that there is not a single insignificant person in your story, and we are all in your story. Lord, remind us that like Rahab, even when our entire world around us may be saying one thing, it is ultimately your voice we need to listen to in the end. God, we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand to receive your benediction this morning and we will sing our last song together, Bond of Love. As you leave this house of worship today, I would remind you of a 
simple woman named Rahab who reminds us all, no one is insignificant. Where will you hear the call this week to remind those people you see who need to hear it? You are one of God's children. Let's follow together. Go in peace.